Well, good morning, church. If you would, grab your Bibles or a device by which you may access the Scriptures and turn to the book of Psalms. That's right. Psalm 119 is where we're going to be this morning. Psalm 119. Is anyone somewhat familiar with Psalm 119? You wish I said Psalm 118, right? Look at that one. I've been told, and maybe I'm inaccurate, that Psalm 118 is the shortest chapter in the Bible, and Psalm 119 is the longest. So I chose the longest because I love you, and I want you to get more of God's Word this morning. Um, But today, we're not going to teach through Psalm 119, but teach from it. Does that make sense? One person said amen, because they're like, 176 (laughs) verses, we want from, not through, today. Um, Well, if I were to entitle our time together this morning, I would call it kind of this, the wonder of the wonderful Word of God. You know, some phrases, words, idioms, not idiots, idioms, those are two different things there, are just too often used in our culture. So we kind of lose the potency of the word as it is intended to be and to give. When you hear the word awesome, I think of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from the 90s, you know, eating pizza. That's what I think of. But when you hear of the word awesome, it's meant to instill within you a sense of what do you think? Starts with an A, ends with an E. Oh, like, wow. Standing in front of the Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls. Six kids asleep on time. You're full of awe, right? Like, wow, this is amazing. Or to wonder. You know, we've lost something in the age of information. We've lost something in the midst of our advances in communication. You see, you may not realize it because you're living in the midst of it, but you live in a pivotal point in the history of your race, humanity, where the way we communicate has changed. See, communication has always been, to a certain degree, oral, written, and visual. However, I would say, in your lifetime, the enhancements we have made towards visual communication have been astounding, have been culture-changing. And what one generation will endure or accept, the next generation will assume or enjoy. See, my kids, when they see a device like this, or maybe that mobile device or tablet that you have, you know what they see? They see shovel and rope. Say, what do you mean? They see a tool. Just like I'm an exennial, born in 1981, graduated in the year 2000. I'm right in the middle of like, where do I belong? I grew up with an analog childhood and a digital college. It was the last of the generation to grow up without a screen in front of me all the time. I'm the last one, not me, but me and my peers, the Xennials. We grew up in this kind of like, where do we belong? We don't belong to Generation X. We don't belong to the Millennials. Who are we? And I would say one of the greatest lacks in my generation, some say that we only exist from 1978 to 1982, like there's not many of us. We don't know who we are. We don't know what to believe. And we don't know who to trust. Because it keeps changing. And so this is what I would say. It's easy to lose your sense of wonder when anything new comes. Because it's shiny for a moment, but only for a moment, it seems. And, and, we've, and we can lose very quickly this sense of wonder of how awesome what you're doing is. Now listen to me. Let, let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. 
You have the ability to freely gather in person or online and hear the Word of God taught, to sing, to serve, to give, to fellowship, to pray, to celebrate new life through baptism. Will that always be afforded to you? I don't know, but I do know it's afforded you today. So invest in it. Grab it by the handles. (laughs) Give. Live for God and for His people. And I want to say something today as we begin this message. God's Word is wonderful. It's wonderful. And someone much more gifted in articulation than I shares that with us today through Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, it's interesting. Not only is it the longest psalm, but it's the longest chapter in the Bible. But here's what I find interesting. It's also an acrostic psalm following the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. See, in the Hebrew Bible, each section of this psalm begins with the letter of the alphabet in Hebrew sequentially. For example, all the verses in the Aleph section, verses 1 through 8, begin with the letter Aleph. It's like this. If you were to open up a commentary and say, well, how is this book, how is this chapter, how is this piece of literature organized? If you follow the Hebrew alphabet, you'll see that through eight verses apiece, the writer of Psalm 119 gives time and attention and poetry and artistry to explaining the wonder of the wonderful Word of God. Now, if we read this in our English translation, we miss this. We miss the poetry. We miss the the beauty, the nuance, the amount of investment that whoever wrote this put into the writing so that you and I would say, God's Word... It's wonderful. Let me show you the alphabet. You know, that's basically what he's done here. You say, well, who wrote this? Nobody knows. Not definitively. Tradition says that King David used this psalm to teach his son Solomon the alphabet. Why was Solomon the wisest one who ever lived? Was it just some kind of magic potion that he drank? A lot of wisdom comes through good training. And parents, you are called to train your children, not entertain your children. There is enough entertainment in this culture where they don't need that from you. They need you to train them. Who am I? How am I supposed to think? What am I supposed to value? See, the number eight is stamped all throughout this psalm. It's interesting. Each section has eight verses. There are eight special names for God's Word listed. There's eight symbols given about the Word of God. And there are eight titles of the Bible in the first nine verses of the psalm. The word eight in Hebrew literally means abundance or more than enough. So maybe we should have eight kids. No, 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 I don't know. Six is good right now. But it's the number eight. It is the number of new beginnings. It's though the writer says this through Psalm 119. God's word is enough. Starting a new season, looking to get a fresh start, this is where you start. Being one who knows the word of God. Why? Why? Do we worship God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Bible? Is that what we're here to do? John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus said this, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these are which that testify of me. It's not a life lived by precepts. It's not a life that's lived based on promises. It's a life that's lived in a vibrant personal relationship with God. And how do you know if that relationship is right or wrong? You think outside the box, but inside the book. I had a mentor that once told me, Neil, if you want to be a creative, God bless you. But what we need in our creatives is more men and women who first know the book, and then they can be as creative as they want. 
The church does not need any more entertainers who do not know the book. Because you know this, the American culture values court jesters. We do. We value those who know how to pretend well in front of a screen. We value those who know how to articulate their voice in such a way that it's pleasurable with musical accompaniment. We think that those people are awesome. Anyone who can take a round ball or a ball that's kind of shaped like a funny shape and get it down a field or in a bucket, we go, those are the people we must follow. That's where we are as a culture. We value the court jesters. It wasn't always that way. Visual communication has changed that. Think about it. If someone were to give a, an amazing artistic rendition of a play in New York 150 years ago, you think you would care? You wouldn't see it. You wouldn't hear about it. But you live in a different culture now. The game has changed. You can stream it while it's happening live. And it can be curated in such a way with the right filter, the right lighting, the right sound, where it's attractional to you. Listen, Nero once said of the Roman people, give them circus and bread. That's how we lead them. Give them circus and bread. In our culture, give them stringing, streaming and sugar, streaming and carbohydrates, whatever you want to call it. But distract them. And that nation fell from within. So here's what is most important, in my opinion. Answering these three questions from Psalm 119. Let's put it up on the screen. Psalm 119 shows us very simple what the Bible is like, what the Bible does, and what we must do with the Bible. So if we were to answer three questions today about the wonder of God's wonderful Word, here's what I hope to land on this morning. I want to show you what the Bible is like. It's not God's bummers. That's not what the Bible is. God's Word is not, oh, that's a good way to live. That's a good view. No, no, no. It's good news. It's the truth. What the Bible does. Man, it really helps you get a great, tight 20-minute nap once a Sunday. No. It does so much more than that. Well, what the Bible does is amazing. And then lastly this. Does it actually require something of me? I would say yes. Yes. To echo Billy Graham. As he once said, the most dangerous sin in America is listening to a sermon. Because in hearing God's word, it's, it's possible to say, I'm doing all that. I believe all that. You can find yourself with intellectual agreement, but your character doesn't align. Your attitudes, your beliefs, your choices, the way you treat people. That's who you are. That's what you believe. And so this morning, I'd love to spend just a little bit of time with you from Psalm 119, not through Psalm 119, looking at what the Bible is like and what it does. And what the Bible requires or how we can respond. Turn with me to Psalm 119, verse 9. And let's consider together what the Bible is like. If you're in Psalm 119, verse 9, let me know by saying, I love, Jesus. I love Jesus. That's a good thing to say every day. Listen to Psalm 119, verse 9. The author, who I believe is David, you don't have to believe that, you have every right to be wrong, but that's what I believe. Yes. Psalm 119, verse 9, this is what the author writes. How can a young man, young person, cleanse his way? Say, listen, are you young? Let me say, well, no, not me. Young at heart? All right, I like that. How do you keep life in such a way where there's no Klingons? How do you keep life in such a way where you can go, man, there's just, there's a purity to it. There's clarity to it. I can have momentum now in my life. I don't, I don't have all this baggage. By taking heed according to your word. Now, I don't know if this is right or wrong, but yesterday was Lainey, Luis, pearls first time to the beach and first time to have a bath you say first time to the beach i saw her there on last sunday at the baptism first time to touch her little toes in the water first time for her to experience a bath and this is baby number six so we're not like 
totally uneducated, you know, about little ones and maybe what could and should, unless you follow the marketing plan of infants, because then it changes every once in a while so they can make more billions off of you. But anyway, like, anyway, I won't get into all that. But water, like if we can put it up on the screen, the wonder of the wonderful Word of God, what the Bible is like, he says it's like water. What does water do? It cleanses. It replenishes. It restores. There's one guy who's trying to help me with my health, and he said, Neil, you need to be drinking a gallon of water a day. What in the world? I, I would go with eight ounces first. A gallon of water a day? He says, that's like, that's foundational. Wow, I'm not even to foundational with water in my physical health. And this is what I would say. You and I need to be daily in the Word. Just as your body needs water, so your soul needs the water of the Word of God for cleansing, for nourishment, to set your priorities straight. Don't you wish there was a church that wanted to help you with that? Don't you wish there was a church that had a video ministry that could give you two-minute daily devos with a reading plan? Oh, wait, here it is. I want to encourage you to follow with us Monday through Friday, just simply reading God's Word. And if you want to, check out the video accompaniment on YouTube or in your email. We can email it to you every single Monday through Friday. I want to tell you something. This is hard for me to share this story. But it will shape and secure your heart. I will never forget when one of my mentors had to bury his eight-year-old because she was diagnosed with cancer two and a half years before and went through a terrible experience of trying to beat cancer. But I'll never forget a sermon that he once shared about when they called and said, hey, your, your daughter is sick. She has a Wilms tumor. It's one of the largest ones we've ever seen. And this is what he said. He said, at that moment, the word of God flooded my heart and mind. And he said, let me tell you something. It's not because I'm a pastor. He said, but it's because my wife and I made this silly little agreement when we first got married that we'd be in God's word together daily. And we just read it. And when, when tragedy hits, when cancer comes, when the valley is there, you better know some Bible. I mean, yes, that's the time to pick up the word of God. But if you're in that rhythm and in that habit of, of washing every day, you get to those and the word of God has this beautiful ability to calm your spirit, to calm your mind, to give you the right perspective. When is the best day to read the Bible? It rhymes with so day, but it starts with a T. It's today. Today is the best day to get in God's Word. It's like water. Look at verse 14 of Psalm 119. The author writes, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies, as much as in all riches. You can write this down if you want, but verse 72 and 127 also shares the same truth. In fact, so does verse 162. But here's the second point. It's a wealth and a treasure. Can I ask a question? And this is okay to say that you like this, because I think you should. If you don't, I don't know how you're going to live. Does anyone here like wealth or money? Like, I would like to have some of that. It's okay. This isn't a trick question. Okay, well, if you don't, how are you paying for those clothes? How did you put deodorant on? You, everyone needs that, right? Some element of money. I don't know anyone that says, I don't want to have more than I need. I've never met that person. In Haiti, Dominican Republic, anywhere I've ever traveled, here in this country, most people go, sure, I'd love to have resource. I don't mind being wealthy. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to be blessed. Now, it's a bad thing to live for it. It's a bad thing to have the things that own you. Well, the things that you own own you. You know what I'm saying. But listen to me. Maybe not you, because we're all good Calvary Chapel people. We know the Bible. But there's some people that do live for wealth over and above everything else. They're out there to get that bag, right? I want to tell you something. The greatest return on investment is the knowledge and application of God's Word. Not, not just the knowledge, but the application. 
And this is what the Bible is like. It's like a wealth. It's like a treasure. And it's free. The Bible is not intellectually discerned. I'll never forget one of my Bible professors telling me this. Neil, you know as much about the Bible as you want because it is the Spirit of God that illuminates truth, not intellectual capacities. So if you're walking in disobedience, if you're someone that shows up to church every single week, but you say, man, but the things I do online with my money or with my entertainment doesn't align with this, no wonder this is boring to you. No wonder this is Charlie Brown's parents. No wonder you can't wait to get out of here. And you're praying for Pedro's to open so one day you can get some tacos right after church. You know, like, <laughs> no wonder. Because attitudes, beliefs, choices, decisions, experiences, friends, goals, habits, that's where you show me what you believe. Your investments. And this is a wealth and a treasure. The third thing comes from verse 24. If you'd like to turn there, you can, but the Word of God says that your testimonies are my delight and my counselors. See, here's the third thing the Bible is like. It's like a companion and a friend. As you go through life, you, you meet a lot of people. And as you continue to go through life, you learn that a lot of the people that you meet, that circle that you really trust, that you'd really go to for counsel, that you'd really be able to say, this is who I am. I need you to be my friend. That circle gets smaller and smaller as you go through life. The psalmist would say, this is the absolute best friend, best counselor, best companion. The Word of God. Verse 54, the author writes, Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. Number four, the Bible, it's a song to sing. I, I think it was funny when we did Father's Day this year, um, we made a video here and one of my daughters was on the video. And I can't remember the question. It's like, what's one of the things your dad does that you don't like or you do like? I don't really remember. But my daughter said, my dad, he always sings in the shower. And I thought, I do? I don't. Okay, maybe I do. But there's an element that usually accompanies certain songs of joy, peace. Some songs are meant to be somber, and those are meant to be sung at the appropriate times. But I find this interesting. As you study church history in the early days of music with the church, minor keys were not allowed. Minor keys gave a sense of somberness. And so for the early church, they wanted it to be this song of joy. Why? May, may I see your eyes? Jesus is alive. Your lost loved one is not lost. He or she is with Jesus if their faith is in Jesus. That should be a life song for you. And what frames that? What informs that? What, how do you know that? This, meditating out at the beach, isn't going to tell you that. General revelation, yes, it speaks of God, but it does not preach the gospel of Jesus clearly. You must have special revelation for that. The Word of God is a song to us. Number five, it's a lamp. Look at verse 105 where the author writes, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know, we've been giving out these bracelets for this series, and if you'd like to grab one, there's a handful of them left, as you make, uh, a handful of them still available. As you make your exit today in the foyer, to the right, right below that mural, there's a couple of these bracelets. And the scripture that is on these bracelets is Psalm 43.3. And this is what it says. Send out your light and your truth. Let them guide me. And these glow in the dark. I love that because I'm up early sometimes riding my bike and it's dark out. I'm like, oh, I can see the little, let your light guide me. You know? But these remind us. That God's truth is that which lights the way. You ever use the flashlight on your phone? <clears throat> I don't know about you, but when I light that thing up in the morning to get up and my daughter is still in our room, little six-week-old baby, and I can't turn on all the lights. I feel like that would be inappropriate for a healthy marriage. Does that make any sense? 
so I have to use my uh, cell phone light. And I don't always see everything, but I see enough to take my first step. And let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. You may be bewildered where you are in life right now. You may feel lost. You may not see the end clearly. Get in line. Nobody does. But I believe wholeheartedly that if you're honest with God and His Word, you know your next step. And that's all He's asking you to take. It will take faith, not finance. Finance may be used in that step, but what is required most is trust. How can my way be lit? If I just look to friends or social media or to this thing that used to be called the news, I don't know that that's what it is anymore, but like, how will I know where to go? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Be a person of God's word. How? Well, there's this thing called daily. No, you know what I'm going to say right there. Get to know God's word. It's a light. It's a lamp. Number seven. Psalm 162 says, I rejoice as your, at your word as one who finds a great treasure. Spoil. To the victor goes the, does anyone know? Spoils. That means not only is it wealth, but it's like wealth that you didn't even earn. Like this is just spoils. Like I'm just here and I just get the gravy train. It's a spoil, a great spoil. Soldiers were made rich from the spoil left by a defeated enemy. And the riches of the word do not come easy. There must be a spiritual battle against Satan and the flesh. Last one for this section, number eight. The word of God is like an inheritance. Verse 111 says, Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. What a most precious inheritance is the word of God. What do you mean by that? Think of all the men and women who have died so that you could have that leather-bound book, so that you could have that device translated in a scripture that you can understand, giving you the ability to participate in a church where it can be explained and applied, and not alone, but in community. That's an inheritance greater than any previous family member that says, here you go, buy yourself that rolls. That rolls is going to rust, right? But the word of God, never pass away never pass away. If you have a phone, this is a great time to like say, I didn't pay attention to anything you just said, so I'm just going to snapshot that and go, that's what I, oh yeah, that's, that's what we talked about. I tell my kids to do that all the time. Say, so, hey, just pay attention to the end. Not that I'm giving you a secret to just sleep during church, but listen, this is like, this is what you need to know. What is the Bible like? The Bible is like water. It's like wealth. It's like a companion. It's a song. It's sweet like honey. It's a lamp. It's great spoil. It's an inheritance. And I think I skipped number five. Is that true? Yes, I did. I have six kids, man. Give me a break. Uh, number five, it's like honey. What is it? It's sweet. I'm sad that I missed that one. because That's a great point to pontificate on. But God's word is not bitter. Oh, I hope you get this. God's word is not God's bummers, but God's enablements. Like, do you want to lead a life that's full and rich and satisfying? Read Psalm 1. Someone who loves the law of God. Sweet. Okay, let's move on to number two in our morning time. What does the Bible do? Well, verses one and two, it blesses. Verses one and two, it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies and seek him with their whole heart. The word of God blesses. Number two, it gives life. Look at Psalm 119, verse 25, my soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. To quicken, as one translation says, means to give life. This generation, the generation preceding it, the generation probably coming after it, is one of the most defeated, discouraged, and depressed generations ever. Yeah, someone knows about it, yeah. Why? There's multitudinous reasons why. Multitudinous reasons. 
But let me share one of them with you. Biblical illiteracy. People don't know God's word. Let me give you an example, and I think she'd be okay with me sharing this. When I got married to my wife, I grew up in a Christian home. My wife grew up in a very good moralistic home. We even went to church here or there. But I grew up like teething on the back of the pew, even though we don't have pews. You know what I'm saying? Like always there. Like knew what this said. And then went to private school and knew what it said in King James, because that's the only one they'd let you, you know, read there. And then I knew what it said. Noah, yeah, I know that story. Jonah, got it. Samson, yep, all about Samson. I know about that story. I marry my wife, who had only been saved for a couple years. And we would talk about these stories that many of us assume people know about, especially in Gulf Breeze and Navarre, right? Everybody knows about Jonah. Everyone knows about Noah. Let me tell you something. That is a lie. Not everyone knows. There is a pastor whom I will not mention who's very well known, who's written books on this very topic that we no longer need to teach some of these old stories. People know them. It's assumed in our culture. What they really just need to hear is kind of like one-liner tweets about truth. I'm summarizing, but that's basically what is said. And I would say this, that is a lie. There's so many children who, I, I met with a guy who meets with uh, teachers every year to kind of help rate who the teacher of the year is. He's like a citizen who helps with this. And he said, you know, I was astounded. I asked some of the teachers who were being considered, D what's the golden rule? None of them knew. The golden rule? And you teach our third graders in public education. Well, it's not part of the curriculum. That's all that we teach them? Just curriculum? We don't use sense or wisdom? Like, I'm telling you something. The generation that is now and that is yet to come, one of our greatest reasons for depression, defeatedness, is we don't know who we are or where to go. There's biblical illiteracy. Are there other reasons? Yes, absolutely. I'm not saying if you know this, you know everything there is to know about life. This is not going to teach me how to hang a ceiling fan. It'll teach me what words to use and not to use when I hang the ceiling fan. <laughs> but it won't show me how to hang the ceiling fan. You know what I'm saying? There's more to life than just reading the Bible. I understand that. But what I'm saying is God's Word gives life. So, get into it. Are we at number three? Okay, we've got to pick up the pace. God's Word gives strength. Verse 28, my soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your Word. I think that's enough. Number four, it gives liberty. Verse 45, I will walk at liberty. Why? Because I seek your precepts. So many Christians are bound up in legalistic rules and rituals that are not in the Bible. And this is what I would say. Please allow the Spirit of God to work in your life in concert with the Word of God because the Spirit of God will never lead you to where the Word of God does not. And the Word of God is the correcting and confirming agent in your life for what you think God wants you to do. And I love what Pastor Chuck Smith used to say. Where the Bible is silent, I am silent. I don't want to put words in God's mouth. There's a lot of people out there that have got a wonderful plan for your life or know exactly what you should do in a situation that's tough. And this is what I would say. Don't walk, up, walk around life bound by other people's opinions. Be free. Be free. How? Verse 45. Because I seek your precepts. I'm living according to your word. You're meant to live free. Number five, God's word, it imparts wisdom. Let me read verses 98 through 100, if I may, to you from Psalm 119. The author writes, You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they're ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. Why? For your testimonies are my meditation, 
I understand more than the ancients. Why? Because I keep your precepts. There are a lot of dumb, smart people. You know what I'm saying about that? Like, there is no God. Look at this thing. It's 8 trillion years old. That just is dumb. Like, Leonidas knows that. He's two and a half. Like, why? Because it's a life that's led by the Word of God. It imparts wisdom. There are many ways to discover truth. Teachers, friends, enemies even. But above them all is God's Word. I love this one. What does the Bible do? I like this one. Number six, it creates friends. Verse 63 of Psalm 119 says, I am a companion of all those who fear you, of all those who keep your precepts. I was talking to somebody earlier this morning how interesting it is to me that in church you get connected to all these different kinds of people with all these different interests or hobbies or occupations or backgrounds. But why are we here? Maybe our spouse is making us. Maybe. Maybe it's just routine. That's possible. For some, maybe it's just that we love God. We love to hear His Word. And at least for me, as someone who's almost 40 years old, the most rewarding relationships I have in my life are connected to men and women who just simply follow the Word of God. Because there's such a stability there. There's such a consistency there. There's such a common ground there. Martin Luther, when he was at the Council of Worms, being inquisit, you know, going through the Inquisition, he said something that I find so interesting. He said, On Scripture and reason I stand. And the implication of that is this. If we can't connect on truth and reasonableness, truth being the Word of God, and reasonableness just being basic common sense, then we can't connect. Not in the long run. Truth. Some of the best and most life-giving relationships are with those who follow God's Word. It creates the kind of friends you actually want. If you're young, if you're not young, and you're looking for friends, look for people who obey God's word. They can be trusted. Number seven, the word of God gives comfort. Let me read verse 76. Let I pray your merciful kindness be for my comfort. According to your word. Verse 92 says, Unless your law had been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. When you walk through death, when you walk through loss, this becomes the comforter of your soul. Number eight, it gives direction. Psalm 133 says, Direct my steps. By social media. No, direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. The Christian life is a walk, one day at a time. And the word directs our steps, both for walking and for running. And one of my professors once said to me, Neil, Christians don't grow day by day. They grow word by word. And men and women who are in the word and then live it, that's those that grow. Again, great time for a photo. What does the Bible do or what the Bible does? It blesses, gives life and strength and liberty and wisdom, creates friends and comfort and direction. Boy, the Bible sounds like a bummer, doesn't it? Sounds like the place no one should hang out. Not to me. So this is where we end. What should we do with the Bible? Well, I like the way this is phrased, what we must do with the Bible. I like that. Number one, I think we should love it. Look at verse 97 of Psalm 119 where he says, Oh, how I love your law. 
It's the meditation, my meditation all day and night. Verse 159 says, Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. Warren Wearsby once said this, The way you treat your Bible is the way you treat Christ. To love Him is to love His Word. Now, is love more, let me ask this question, is love more an emotion or motion? It's motion. Read uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Tell me which of those are emotive. To be kind is a choice. To be patient is a choice. To be long-suffering is a choice. That's what love is. Does that mean there's not emotion attached to love? Absolutely not. There definitively is. But listen to me. Stop focusing on goals and start focusing on systems. That's how you win. That's how you win. System. I'm in God's Word daily. That's what I'm focused on. What's it going to produce? Friends, wisdom, light. But if I make my goal light, friends, wisdom, good luck. But if you say, no, I'm focused on a system, I'm in God's Word daily. What will that do over time? Here's what it'll do. I love this thing. (laughs) I'm putting the motion in first and trusting that the emotion will follow second. Those that lose, wait for emotion to put motion in. Those that win, put motion in first and allow God to bring the emotion. Apply that to your marriage. Well, I just am kind when I feel like it. You won't be married very long. Apply that to your children. I'll just be patient with them when they do the right thing. Well, when is that? When do they do the right thing? Show me that. Show me that fantasy. Like, no, I I put the motion in first and trust God to bring the emotion. Number one, we should love God's Word. Because that which you feed grows and that which you starve dies. If you'll feed the Spirit, You'll begin to love the things of the Spirit. If you feed the flesh, you will lust after the things of the flesh. You'll never love it. You'll lust it. And that brings death because it's the sugar-coated poison apple the flesh is. Number two, we should prize it. Look at verse 72. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins and gold and silver. Verse 128, therefore all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right and I hate every false way. Warren Wearsby says, to hold the, high, the Bible in high esteem is the mark of a true saint. It should be more precious than any earthly treasure. Number three, we should study it. Study it. Well, there's a lot of verses here in Psalm 119, but let me just read... I'll just read a short one. Verse 12. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Yeah, that's what we should do. We should study God's Word. Number four, we should memorize it. Verse 11. The author writes, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Memorize it. Getting it into your mind. How can God bring to something to your remembrance that isn't in your rememberer? That doesn't make any sense. Like, it's got to be in there, right? It does not do... Like, I tried this in Bible class at Aletheia. I'll just take a quick nap. That doesn't work. Osmosis in the Scripture does not work. I have to read it and memorize it. Number five, meditate upon it. Verse 15 says, I will meditate and contemplate your precepts and ways. Let me give you a simple illustration of what this looks like. To get a handle on God's Word. To hear, read, study, memorize, and meditate. And you know, the opposable thumb is a big deal for humans. It separates us from some different situations. If I want to grasp on God's Word, it's not just getting it in, getting it in, getting it in, getting it in, getting it in. You must meditate on it. Give it some time. Have you ever baked a cake? What if it's like, I can bake this cake in four minutes. I'm going to get her done. No, you won't. You'll have a goopy, soupy mess that nobody likes. But let it bake. Give it time. That's what gives you that handle on God's Word. There is no substitute for time and experience. Those that grow up in a YouTube generation will be challenged with this. Because information is at a premium. Time and experience is not. 
but it takes time, experience, and information to win the day. So hear the Word, read the Word, study the Word, memorize the Word, meditate upon the Word. Number six, we should trust God's Word. The author writes in verse 42, So shall I answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your Word. There's so many things in life that you could say, this is what I trust. Oh, thank you, Fox News or CNN, whichever camp you're in. That's where I trust. Trust God's word. Trust God's word. And then tr trust people with credible sources. Remember that when you were like in third grade and your teacher's like, where's the bibliography page? I need to see cited credible sources. Don't forget that. Information must come from a good source. Number seven, obey God's word. Oh, I want to challenge you to read just the first eight verses of Psalm 119 today. Before your head hits the pillow, spouse, keep your other spouse accountable to this. Verses one through eight. It's, it's the aleph acrostic. It's the very way he opens it up. But he tells us to obey God's word. What if I told my daughters, girls, I need you to go clean your room. Come back 20 minutes later and they say, Dad, we heard what you said. What? Go clean your room. I'll be back. I come back, Dad, we studied in the original language what you said. <laughs> and this camp believes it's this way and this camp believes it that way, but we're just praying one day we will come to illumination. No, clean your room. I'm coming back. Okay. Dad, we've started groups. And now we've got more people studying in the original language what you've said. And we're even memorizing it. Dad, we've got bracelets. We've got T-shirts. We're starting to sing songs. Clean your room. Clean your room. <laughs> and then you go in the room. The room's a mess. And you say this. No, 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 no. I need you to clean your room. You mean actually do something? Yes. Why is this written? So we can sing songs? So we can wear clothes? So we can have something to do on a Sunday morning? No! You're meant to learn the Bible so you can live the Bible. Billy Graham, the most dangerous sin in America, listening to a sermon. What you're doing right now is dangerous because you can become accustomed or even asleep amidst something that is holy. And people have died so that you could do this. Obey it. Psalm chapter 119, verses 1 through 8. Let me just read the first verse. Blessed are they undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Attitudes, beliefs, choices, decisions, experiences, friends, goals, habits, interests, investments, jokes, whatever it is. That shows you who you are. Last thing this morning. Declare it. Verse 13. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have declared my ways and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. As we obey, we've got to tell other people about Jesus. And what's the best way to share your testimony? Most definitely. They need to see that it's real, but they also need to know what is real. Like you can't just be, hey man, this is my view. It works for me. No, 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 no. That's just called good views. That's what we should start. Oh, we've got good views, good views, good views. No, it's called good news. This is true. God came as a man, died in your place and mine. He died my death so I could live his life. This is true. It needs to be declared. Now, I got so much more we could say about God's word, but I'm going to have to land it here. Because I need to share something with you that I feel is a conviction. No one wakes up from the womb knowing these things. You must be trained. I have a family member that once, I don't know that she coined this phrase, but I, I like it. I think it's awesome. She's the first person that said it that I ever heard it from. Every thoroughbred needs a trainer. Doesn't matter who you are, how gifted, how talented, how passionate, how self sufficient. You have blind spots. You need someone coming alongside that you trust that can say, listen, 
this is where you need to tighten up. Oh, if you keep going down that way, this is where it ends. You need a trainer. My kids, my kids see me at my worst. If I have a best, my kids see that too. But what they see in me most, hopefully, is what it means to be someone who's experienced new life and can show them what matters in life. Training all the time. Every single word, every single facial expression, every single choice. It's leaning into their training. Our students need you. Our children need you. When I lived in Destin, I would come across different shop owners, different department store owners, different friends who ran different businesses. And I kept hearing this same complaint. Man, those young kids. Nobody knows how to do an interview. Nobody knows how to work an eight-hour shift. Nobody knows how to exit gracefully or treat people with customer service like they should. And I kept saying, well, okay. So what are we doing about that? We just expect it? And then I moved here a couple years ago and thought, man, you know who really helped me? Chuck Smith really helped me. Brian Broderson, Don McClure, John Corson, John Spencer, Mike Doyle, Mark Swift, Roger Jan, Dave Guzik. These guys are really, Ricky Ryan, Britt Merrick. These are all kind of the people that invested in me. Thank God. Because without good trainers, I wouldn't know what to do. Great mom and dad who gave me an example of 18 years of living in their home of what marriage looks like, of what family looks like. Thank God for that. A community to be a part of called a church. Like, okay, it's still here after 38 years. It must be good. <laughs> it's healthy. That's awesome. But what about the next generation? I got all these kids. Who's going to help them? Well, obviously God said, you are. Oh, boy. I'll help them. But what about all these other kids? Who's going to train them? I can't do it. I got enough going on in my own life. So I kept coming back to this concept what, 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 what happened to me? What helped, what helped me? Work helped me. Having a dairy farmer for a grandfather and a German gentleman who was my step-grandfather who had a shop that was like crazy organized, like, whoa, that guy knows what to do. These guys are workers. What helped me? Learning the Bible, learning the skill of faithfulness, and learning that work is my platform for worship not the definition of my worth. And someone to train me how to interview, how to speak, how to work hard, how to not steal company time through laziness, how to like exit a job in the right way. These were learned skill sets. So what if there was a crucible in Gulf Breeze, Florida called SHOP that allowed students to hone occupational performance? where they could learn the value of faithfulness, where they could learn that work is not your worth, work is your platform to worship. Well, then I thought, well, we don't want to be white noise. We've got to find a hole in the market. We don't want to, you know, I don't know what's a lot here, like another, another uh, Dollar General. Should I open up that? Should we open up a mattress store? Should we, what should we do here, Lord? Like, no, no, no. That would be just white noise. We already got those. What about a coffee shop? Ooh, we could do with one of those. So how does this land? Where do we end? Let me show you this quick video, because I feel like this is a wonderful application to the wonder of God's wonderful word, and then we'll pray together. Let me share with you the heart and vision behind the shop. One of the greatest experiences I ever had the opportunity to experience in training for ministry was my time at Calvary Chapel Bible College, located in Marietta. California. And in that two-year experience, I had the great opportunity to learn from men like John Corson and Pastor Chuck Smith and Don McClure and Pastor Brian Broderson. These men would come on site 
to teach our men's discipleship classes. And during that time, not only did I gain a grasp of the Word of God, but also two other tremendous life skills that I'm so grateful for. The first is the value of faithfulness. You know, we're told in the Word of God that that which is required of God's servant is very simple, that they learn to be faithful. And the second thing that I would say, although there's many, is, is simply this reality, that you and I are not defined by the things that we do, but we're defined by who we are in Christ. See, what we do for work, it doesn't define our worth, but work is our platform for worship. And these things for me, this, this value of faithfulness, this idea that work is not my worth, but work is my platform to worship God, these were learned things for me. I didn't wake up from the womb knowing these things. And then my wife and I had this wonderful opportunity to church plant in the city of Destin and get to know so many people in that community and surrounding communities. And there was this dynamic where there was this lack of awareness specifically amongst our young students, that their identity isn't tied up into anything or anyone else other than who they are in Christ, and that they truly can learn to discover who they are and what God has gifted them to do with a little bit of training. And I came across shop owners who were frustrated that they couldn't find good employees to, to be hired, to learn to work a shift, or learn how to exit that job gracefully. So I thought, well, what if, God, you provided a space where we could help students hone occupational performance, S-H-O-P. What if there was a shop where we came alongside students and helped them discover their identity in Christ, learn the value of faithfulness, learn the reality that work is not their worth, but work is worship. And what if there was a way to do that in the marketplace to serve our community? Is there anything in Gulf Breeze that we could do with a little bit more of? And as I began to observe the area and see what was around us, I said, you know, Lord, what about a coffee shop? And so Lord willing, we have a heart to open our very first shop. But as the Lord is moving in Gulf Breeze, he's opened a door with Interlight Surf Shop in Gulf Breeze, Florida, to open up a shop. This fall, it'll be a coffee shop with a little stage and an opportunity for open mic nights and things of that nature. But the heartbeat is to be an outreach ministry to our community by training students to hone their occupational performance and to serve our community with a good cup of coffee and a Christ-centered ministry environment. And so I'd like to introduce you to Josh Thurber. Hey church, I'm Josh Thurber and I'm responsible for managing and overseeing the Golf Breeze shop. Up to this point, our talented Coastline team have been working diligently on cafe design, licensing, coffee and beverage quality, equipment options, and more. Our next step in this process is to hire an amazing staff. Now this is where you come in. We're seeking to onboard and train a few full-time and part-time baristas to create great customer experience, as well as to implement our vision and mission for the shop. Now there's a lot of everyday tasks for a barista, and we will certainly provide training on beverage quality, customer care, and the best business practices. But the primary qualities that we're looking for are calling, capability, chemistry, and character. If you are interested in this opportunity and would like to find out more, here's how to apply. Please email your name, age, resume, and any additional experience that you have to josh at coastlinelife.com. So if you're interested in partnering with us to see students grow in their ability to learn that God is faithful and so too can they be, and also that God has a plan for their life and the work that they can contribute, it's not just about them making a buck, but it's how they worship God. I encourage you to contact us. Reach out to Josh at josh at coastlinelife.com. If you'd like to apply for employment, if you'd like to pray for us, if you'd like to give toward this endeavor, we would love to partner with you as we begin to launch this new ministry known as The Shop. Okay, oh yeah. Let's, uh, let's stand together. Um, we're going to close out our service this morning just by singing a benediction that we've been singing, oh, since last year. Um, but hopefully you picked up on some of the nuance of the shop. You may say, so coffee is the only place to train someone? No. We could make ice cream shops. We could make bike shops. We could make toy shops. We could make any kind of shop you want. Um, but not yet. <laughs> 
Let's just do what the Lord's open and led us to do. I'd ask you to pray for Coastline Navarre and Coastline Destin as they were presented with this information a little over a year ago. And they're thinking, huh, we could do this in, in Destin and Navarre as well um, and other individuals. Um, but this is just a simple way for our church to walk through an open door where we've had people donate resources and equipment and things that we didn't anticipate. Um, so it seems like you've heard the phrase where God guides, God provides. Well, also sometimes where God is providing is where he is guiding. And God seems to continually provide for this ministry. So we're at a stage, as was mentioned in the video, where it's like, well, we're going to start having to hire more people. Um, so we'll just let people know that and then see what the Lord does. But this is all out of this message that we're looking at today. <laughs> Why? We want kids to know God's word and to live it. What would it look like for Gulf Breeze to be filled with in two generations from now, people at every gas station, every coffee shop, every food service, every tourism thing, that they knew how to think and knew how to work? Boy, that would change our culture. I think a church gathering, definitely, it's where it comes from. But work is where we are. Work is where we reach people. But it will not happen unless someone says, let's begin the training. If there is no leadership development pipeline for the next generation, there will be no next generation. And I believe, if I, as I look at every single one of you, that you have something to invest in others. Training, knowledge, time, prayers, whatever it is. God's given to you so you can give to others. He's resourced you so you can resource others, not for you to be a reservoir. Reservoirs are miserable. Those that resource are the ones that live life to the fullest. So I'm going to ask us to pray over this initiative, and I'm going to ask God that he would continue to give a passion for his word, that you'd learn to love it. How do I do that? There's this program, Daily in the Word. You can check that out. Okay, that's enough pitch. I've hit that thing pretty hard. But I want you to do well. Be in God's Word. That's how you'll do well.